Chapter Twenty Eight of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by the Story Girl. Chapter Twenty Eight The Game and Its Players. It was not long after John Pendleton's second visit that Milly Snow called one afternoon. Milly Snow had never before been to the Harrington homestead. She blushed and looked very embarrassed when Miss Polly entered the room. "'I... I came to inquire for the little girl,' she stammered. "'You were very kind. She is about the same. "'How is your mother?' rejoined Miss Polly wearily. "'That is what I came to tell you. That is, to ask you to tell Miss Pollyanna,' hurried on the girl, breathlessly and incoherently. "'We think it's so awful, so perfectly awful, that the little thing can't ever walk again. And after all she's done for us, too. For mother, you know, teaching her to play the game and all that. And when we heard how now she couldn't play it herself, poor little dear, I'm sure I don't see how she can, either, in her condition.' And when we remembered all the things she'd said to us, we thought if she could only know what she had done for us, that it would help, you know, in her own case, about the game, because she could be glad. That is, a little glad. Milly stopped helplessly, and seemed to be waiting for Miss Polly to speak. Miss Polly had sat politely listening, but with a puzzled questioning in her eyes. Only about half of what had been said had she understood. She was thinking now that she always had known that Milly Snow was queer, but she had not supposed she was crazy. In no other way, however, could she account for this incoherent, illogical, unmeaning rush of words. When the pause came, she filled it with a quiet, I don't think I quite understand, Milly. Just what is it that you want me to tell my niece? Yes, that's it. I want you to tell her, answered the girl feverishly. Make her see what she's done for us. Of course, she's seen some things because she's been there and she's known mother is different, but I want her to know how different she is. And me too. I'm different. I've been trying to play it, the game, a little. Miss Polly frowned. She would have asked what Milly meant by this game, but there was no opportunity. Milly was rushing on again with nervous volubility. You know, nothing was ever right before, for Mother. She was always wanting them different. And really, I don't know as one could blame her much, under the circumstances. But now she lets me keep the shades up, and she takes interest in things, how she looks, and her nightdress, and all that. And she's actually begun to knit little things, reins and baby blankets for fairs and hospitals. And she's so interested and so glad to think she can do it. And that was all Miss Pollyanna's doings, you know, because she told Mother she could be glad she'd got her hands and arms anyway, and that made Mother wonder right away why she didn't do something with her hands and arms. And so she began to do something. To knit, you know. And you can't think what a different room it is now, what with the red and blue and yellow worsteds and the prisms on the window that she gave her. Why, it actually makes you feel better just to go in there now. And before I used to dread it awfully. It was so dark and gloomy, and Mother was so... so unhappy, you know. And so we want you to please tell Miss Pollyanna that we understand it's all because of her. And so we want you to please tell Miss Pollyanna that we understand it's all because of her. And please say we're so glad we know her, that we thought... Maybe if she knew it, it would make her a little glad that she knew us. And, and that's all. 
sighed Millie, rising hurriedly to her feet. "'You'll tell her?' "'Why, of course,' murmured Miss Polly, wondering just how much of this remarkable discourse she could remember to tell. These visits of John Pendleton and Millie Snow were only the first of many, and always there were the messages— the messages which were in some ways so curious that they caused Miss Polly more and more to puzzle over them. One day there was the little widow Benton. Miss Polly knew her well, though they had never called upon each other. By reputation she knew her as the saddest little woman in town, one who was always in black. Today, however, Mrs. Benton wore a knot of pale blue at the throat, though there were tears in her eyes. She spoke of her grief and horror at the accident. Then she asked diffidently if she might see Pollyanna. Miss Polly shook her head. "'I am sorry, but she sees no one yet. A little later, perhaps.' Mrs. Benton wiped her eyes rose and turned to go. But after she had almost reached the hall door, she came back hurriedly. "'Miss Harrington, perhaps you'd give her a message?' she stammered. "'Certainly, Mrs. Benton, I shall be very glad to.' Still the little woman hesitated. Then she spoke. "'Will you tell her, please, that that I've put on this," she said, just touching the blue bow at her throat. Then, at Miss Polly's ill-concealed look of surprise, she added, "'The little girl has been trying for so long to make me wear some color that I thought she'd be glad to know I'd begun. She said that Freddy would be so glad to see it if I would. You know, Freddy's all I have now. The others have all... Mrs. Benton shook her head and turned away. If you'll just tell Pollyanna, she'll understand. And the door closed after her. A little later, that same day, there was the other widow. At least she wore widow's garments. Miss Polly did not know her at all, she wondered vaguely how Pollyanna could have known her. The lady gave her name as Mrs. Tarbell. "'I'm a stranger to you, of course,' she began at once. "'But I'm not a stranger to your little niece, Pollyanna. "'I've been at the hotel all summer, and every day I've had to take long walks for my health. "'It was on these walks that I've met your niece,' She's such a dear little girl. I wish I could make you understand what she's been to me. I was very sad when I came up here, and her bright face and cheery ways reminded me of my own little girl that I lost years ago. I was so shocked to hear of the accident, and then when I learned that the poor child would never walk again— and that she was so unhappy because she couldn't be glad any longer. The dear child, I just had to come to you. You are very kind, murmured Miss Polly. But it is you who are to be kind, demurred the other. I, I want you to give her a message from me. Will you? Certainly. Will you just tell her, then? that Mrs. Tarbell is glad now. Yes, I know it sounds odd, and you don't understand, but if you'll pardon me, I'd rather not explain. Sad lines came to the lady's mouth, and the smile left her eyes. Your niece will know just what I mean. And I felt that I must tell her. Thank you. "'And pardon me, please, for any seeming rudeness in my call,' she begged, as she took her leave. Thoroughly mystified now, Miss Polly hurried upstairs to Pollyanna's room. 
Pollyanna, do you know a Mrs. Tarbell? Oh, yes. I love Mrs. Tarbell. She's sick and awfully sad, and she is at the hotel and takes long walks. We go together. I mean, we used to. Pollyanna's voice broke, and two big tears rolled down her cheeks. Miss Polly cleared her throat hurriedly. Well, she's just been here, dear. She left a message for you, but she wouldn't tell me what it meant. She said to tell you that Mrs. Tarbell is glad now. Pollyanna clapped her hands softly. Did she say that? Really? Oh, I'm so glad. But Pollyanna, what did she mean? Why, it's the game, and... Pollyanna stopped short, her fingers to her lips. N nothing much, Aunt Polly. That is, I can't tell it unless I tell other things that that I'm not to speak of. It was on Miss Polly's tongue to question her niece further, but the obvious distress on the little girl's face stayed the words before they were uttered. Not long after Mrs. Tarbell's visit, the climax came. It came in the shape of a call from a certain young woman with unnaturally pink cheeks and abnormally yellow hair. A young woman who wore high heels and cheap jewelry. A young woman whom Miss Polly knew very well by reputation, but whom she was angrily amazed to meet beneath the roof of the Harrington homestead. Miss Polly did not offer her hand. She drew back, indeed, as she entered the room. The woman rose at once. Her eyes were very red, as if she had been crying. Half defiantly, she asked if she might, for a moment, see the little girl, Pollyanna. Miss Polly said no. She began to say it very sternly, but something in the woman's pleading eyes made her add the civil explanation that no one was allowed yet to see Pollyanna. The woman hesitated. Then, a little brusquely, she spoke. Her chin was still at a slightly defiant tilt. "'My name is Mrs. Payson, Mrs. Tom Payson. I presume you've heard of me. Most of the good people in the town have. And maybe some of the things you've heard ain't true. But never mind that. It's about the little girl I came. I heard about the accident, and—and and it broke me all up. Last week I heard how she couldn't ever walk again, and, and I wished I could give up my two uselessly well legs for hers. She'd do more good trotting around on em one hour than I could in a hundred years. But never mind that. Legs ain't always given to the ones who can make the best use of em, I notice. She paused and cleared her throat, but when she resumed, her voice was still husky. Maybe you don't know it, but I've seen a good deal of that little girl of yours. We live on the Pendleton Hill Road, and she used to go by often, only she didn't always go by. She came in and played with the kids and talked to me and my man when he was home. She seemed to like it and to like us. She didn't know, I suspect, that her kind of folks don't generally call on my kind. Maybe if they did call more, Miss Harrington, there wouldn't be so many of my kind, she added with sudden bitterness. Be that as it may, she came, and she didn't do herself no harm, and she did do us good, a lot of good. How much she won't know nor can't know, I hope, cause if she did, she'd know other things that I don't want her to know. But it's just this. It's been hard times with us this year, in more ways than one. We've been blue and discouraged, 
my man and me, and ready for most anything, was reckoning on getting a divorce about now, and letting the kids... Well, we didn't know what we would do with the kids. Then came the accident, and what we heard about the little girls never walking again. And we got to thinking how she used to come and sit on our doorstep and train with the kids and laugh and and just be glad. She was always being glad about something. And then one day she told us why. And about the game, you know. And tried to coax us to play it. Well, we've heard now that she's fretting her poor little life out of her because she can't play it no more, that there's nothing to be glad about. And that's what I came to tell her today, that maybe she can be a little glad for us, because we've decided to stick to each other and play the game ourselves. I knew she would be glad, because she used to feel kind of bad. That's things we said sometimes just how the game is going to help us. I can't say that I exactly see yet. But maybe Twill? Anyhow, we're going to try. Because she wanted us to. Will you tell her? Yes, I will tell her, promised Miss Polly a little faintly. Then with sudden impulse, she stepped forward and held out her hand. "'And thank you for coming, Mrs. Payson,' she said simply. The defiant chin fell. The lips above it trembled visibly. With an incoherently mumbled something, Mrs. Payson blindly clutched at the outstretched hand, turned and fled." The door had scarcely closed behind her before Miss Polly was confronting Nancy in the kitchen. Nancy! Miss Polly spoke sharply. The series of puzzling, disconcerting visits of the last few days, culminating as they had in the extraordinary experience of the afternoon, had strained her nerves to the snapping point. Not since Miss Pollyanna's accident had Nancy heard her mistress speak so sternly. "'Nancy, will you tell me what this absurd game is that the whole town seems to be babbling about? And what, please, has my niece to do with it? Why does everybody, from Millie Snow to Mrs. Tom Payson, send word to her that they're playing it?' As near as I can judge, half the town are putting on blue ribbons, or stopping family quarrels, or learning to like something they never liked before, and all because of Pollyanna. I tried to ask the child herself about it, but I can't seem to make much headway, and of course I don't like to worry her, now. But from something I heard her say to you last night, I should judge you were one of them too. Now will you tell me what it all means? To Miss Polly's surprise and dismay, Nancy burst into tears. "'It means that ever since last June, that blessed child has just been making the whole town glad, and now they're turning round and trying to make her a little glad, too.' "'Glad of what?' "'Just glad. That's the game.' Miss Polly actually stamped her foot. There you go like all the rest, Nancy. What game? Nancy lifted her chin. She faced her mistress and looked her squarely in the eye. I'll tell you, ma'am. It's a game Miss Pollyanna's father learned her to play. She got a pair of crutches once in a missionary barrel when she was wanting a doll. And she cried, of course, like any child would. It seems twas then her father told her that there wasn't ever anything but what there was something about it that you could be glad about, and that she could be glad about them crutches. Glad for crutches. Miss Polly choked back a sob. She was thinking of the helpless little legs on the bed upstairs. 
Yes, that's what I said. And Miss Pollyanna said that's what she said, too. But he told her she could be glad, cause she didn't need him. Oh, cried Miss Polly. And after that, she said he made a regular game of it, finding something and everything to be glad about. And she said you could do it too, and that you didn't seem to mind not having the doll so much, cause you was so glad you didn't need the crutches. And they called it the just being glad game. That's the game, ma'am. She's played it ever since. But how? How? Oh. Miss Polly came to a helpless pause. And you'd be surprised to find how cute it works, ma'am, too maintained Nancy, with almost the eagerness of Pollyanna herself. I wish I could tell you what a lot she's done for Mother and the folks out home. She's been to see him, you know, twice with me. She's made me glad, too, on such a lot of things. Little things, and big things, and it's made them so much easier. For instance, I don't mind Nancy for a name half as much since she told me I could be glad twant Hepzibah. And there's Monday mornings, too, that I used to hate so. She's actually made me glad for Monday mornings. Glad? For Monday mornings? Nancy laughed. I know it does sound nutty, ma'am. But let me tell ye, that blessed lamb found out I hated Monday morning something awful. And what does she up and tell me one day but this? Well, anyhow, Nancy, I should think you could be gladder on Monday morning than on any other day in the week, cause twould be a whole week before you'd have another one. And I'm blessed if I ain't thought of it every Monday morning since. And it has helped, ma'am. It made me laugh, anyhow. Every time I thought of it, and laughing helps, you know. It does, it does. But why hasn't she told me the game, faltered Miss Polly. Why has she made such a mystery of it when I asked her? Nancy hesitated. Begging your pardon, ma'am. You told her not to speak of her father, so she couldn't tell ye. "'Twas her father's game, you see?' Miss Polly bit her lip. "'She wanted to tell ye, first off,' continued Nancy, a little unsteadily. "'She wanted somebody to play it with, you know. "'That's why I begun it, so she could have someone. "'And—and and these others?' Miss Polly's voice shook now. Oh, everybody most knows it now, I guess. Anyhow, I should think they did from the way I'm hearing of it everywhere I go. Of course, she told a lot, and they told the rest. Then things go, you know, when they get started. And she was always so smiling and pleasant to everyone, and so... so just glad herself all the time, that they couldn't help knowing it anyhow. Now, since she's hurt, everybody feels so bad. Especially when they heard how bad she feels, cause she can't find anything to be glad about. And so they've been coming every day to tell her how glad she's made them, hoping that'll help some. You see, she's always wanted everybody to play the game with her. Well, I know somebody who will play it. Now choked Miss Polly, as she turned and sped through the kitchen doorway. Behind her, Nancy stood staring amazedly. "'Well, I'll believe anything. Anything now,' she muttered to herself. "'You can't stump me with anything I wouldn't believe now. A Miss Polly.' A little later, in Pollyanna's room, the nurse left Miss Polly and Pollyanna alone together. "'And you've had still another caller today, my dear,' announced Miss Polly, 
in a voice she vainly tried to steady. "'Do you remember Mrs. Payson?' "'Mrs. Payson? Why, I reckon I do. She lives on the way to Mr. Pendleton's, and she's got the prettiest little girl baby, three years old, and a boy, most five. She's awfully nice, and so's her husband. Only they don't seem to know how nice each other is. Sometimes they fight, or, I mean, they don't quite agree. They're poor, too, they say, and of course they don't ever have barrels, cause he isn't a missionary minister, you know, like... Well, he isn't. A faint color stole into Pollyanna's cheeks, which was duplicated suddenly in those of her aunt. But she wears real pretty clothes sometimes, in spite of their being so poor, resumed Pollyanna, in some haste. And she's got perfectly beautiful rings with diamonds and rubies and emeralds in them. But she says she's got one ring too many, and that she's going to throw it away and get a divorce instead. What is a divorce, Aunt Polly? I'm afraid it isn't very nice, because she didn't look happy when she talked about it. And she said if she did get it, they wouldn't live there any more, and that Mr. Payson would go way off, and maybe the children too. But I should think they'd rather keep the ring, even if they did have so many more. Shouldn't you? Aunt Polly, what is a divorce? But they aren't going way off, dear, evaded Aunt Polly hurriedly. They're going to stay right there together. Oh, I'm so glad. Then they'll be there when I go up to see... Oh, dear broke off the little girl miserably. And Polly, why can't I remember that my legs don't go any more? And then I won't ever, ever go up to see Mr. Pendleton again. There, there, don't, choked her aunt. Perhaps you'll drive up some time. But listen, I haven't told you yet all that Mrs. Payson said. She wanted me to tell you that they... they were going to stay together and to play the game, just as you wanted them to. Pollyanna smiled through tear-wet eyes. Did they? Did they really? Oh, I am glad of that. Yes. She said she hoped you'd be. That's why she told you. To make you glad, Pollyanna. Pollyanna looked up quickly. Why, Aunt Polly, you... You spoke just as if you knew. Do you know about the game, Aunt Polly? Yes, dear. Miss Polly sternly forced her voice to be cheerfully matter-of-fact. Nancy told me. I think it's a beautiful game. I'm going to play it now. With you. Oh, Aunt Polly. You? I'm so glad. You see, I've really wanted you, most of anybody, all the time. Aunt Polly caught her breath a little sharply. It was even harder this time to keep her voice steady. But she did it. Yes, dear. And there were all those others, too. Why, Pollyanna, I think all the town is playing that game now with you, even to the minister. I haven't had a chance to tell you yet, but this morning I met Mr. Ford when I was down to the village, and he told me to say to you that just as soon as you could see him, he was coming to tell you that he hadn't stopped being glad over those eight hundred rejoicing texts that you told him about. So you see, dear, it's just you that have done it. The whole town is playing the game, and the whole town is wonderfully happier, and all because of one little girl who taught the people a new game and how to play it. Pollyanna clapped her hands. Oh, 
I'm so glad, she cried. Then suddenly a wonderful light illumined her face. Why, Aunt Polly, there is something I can be glad about after all. I can be glad I've had my legs, anyway. Else I couldn't have done that. End of chapter 28 Read by the Story Girl Chapter 29 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by The Story Girl. Chapter 29 Through an Open Window One by one the short winter days came and went. But they were not short to Pollyanna. They were long and sometimes full of pain. Very resolutely these days, however, Pollyanna was turning a cheerful face toward whatever came. Was she not specially bound to play the game now that Aunt Polly was playing it too? And Aunt Polly found so many things to be glad about. It was Aunt Polly, too, who discovered the story one day about the two poor little waifs in a snowstorm who found a blown-down door to crawl under and who wondered what poor folks did that didn't have any door. And it was Aunt Polly who brought home the other story that she had heard about the poor old lady who had only two teeth, but who was so glad that those two teeth hid. Pollyanna now, like Mrs. Snow, was knitting wonderful things out of bright colored worsteds that trailed their cheery lengths across the white spread, and made Pollyanna, again like Mrs. Snow, so glad she had her hands and arms, anyway. Pollyanna saw people now, occasionally, and always there were the loving messages from those she could not see, and always they brought her something new to think about, and Pollyanna needed new things to think about. Once she had seen John Pendleton, and twice she had seen Jimmy Bean, John Pendleton had told her what a fine boy Jimmy was getting to be, and how well he was doing. Jimmy had told her what a first-rate home he had, and what bang-up folks Mr. Pendleton made. And both had said that it was all owing to her. "'Which makes me all the gladder, you know, that I have had my legs,' Pollyanna confided to her aunt afterwards. The winter passed and spring came. The anxious watchers over Pollyanna's condition could see little change wrought by the prescribed treatment. There seemed every reason to believe, indeed, that Dr. Meade's worst fears would be realized, that Pollyanna would never walk again. Beldingsville, of course, kept itself informed concerning Pollyanna, and of Beldingsville, one man in particular fumed and fretted himself into a fever of anxiety over the daily bulletins which he managed in some way to procure from the bed of suffering. As the days passed, however, and the news came to be no better, but rather worse, something besides anxiety began to show in the man's face. Despair, and a very dogged determination, each fighting for the mastery, in the end, the dogged determination won, and it was then that Mr. John Pendleton, somewhat to his surprise, received one Saturday morning a call from Dr. Thomas Chilton. Pendleton, began the doctor abruptly, I've come to you because you, better than anyone else in town, know something of my relations with Miss Polly Harrington. John Pendleton was conscious that he must have started visibly. He did know something of the affair between Polly Harrington and Thomas Chilton, but the matter had not been mentioned between them for fifteen years or more. Yes, he said, trying to make his voice sound concerned enough for sympathy, 
and not eager enough for curiosity. In a moment he saw that he need not have worried, however. The doctor was quite too intent on his errand to notice how that errand was received. Pendleton, I want to see that child. I want to make an examination. I must make an examination. Well, can't you? Can't I? Pendleton, you know very well I haven't been inside that door for more than fifteen years. You don't know, but I will tell you, that the mistress of that house told me that the next time she asked me to enter it, I might take it that she was begging my pardon, and that all would be as before, which meant that she'd marry me. Perhaps you see her summoning me now, but I don't. But couldn't you go without a summons? The doctor frowned. Well, hardly. I have some pride, you know. But if you're so anxious, couldn't you swallow your pride and forget the quarrel? Forget the quarrel, interrupted the doctor savagely. I'm not talking of that kind of pride. So far as that is concerned, I'd go from here, there, on my knees, or on my head, if that would do any good. It's professional pride I'm talking about. It's a case of sickness, and I'm a doctor. I can't butt in and say, Here, take me. Can I? Chilton, what was the quarrel? demanded Pendleton. The doctor made an impatient gesture and got to his feet. What was it? What's any lover's quarrel after it's over? He snarled, pacing the room angrily. A silly wrangle over the size of the moon or the depth of a river, maybe. It might as well be, so far as it's having any real significance compared to the years of misery that follow them. Never mind the quarrel. So far as I am concerned, I am willing to say there was no quarrel. Pendleton, I must see that child. It may mean life or death. It will mean, I honestly believe. Nine chances out of ten that Pollyanna Whittier will walk again. The words were spoken clearly, impressively, and they were spoken just as the one who uttered them had almost reached the open window near John Pendleton's chair. Thus it happened that very distinctly they reached the ears of a small boy kneeling beneath the window on the ground outside. Jimmy Bean, at his Saturday morning task of pulling up the first little green weeds of the flower beds, sat up with ears and eyes wide open. Walk! Pollyanna! John Pendleton was saying. What do you mean? I mean that from what I can hear and learn, a mile from her bedside, that her case is very much like one that a college friend of mine has just helped. For years he's been making this sort of thing a special study. I've kept in touch with him, and studied too, in a way. And from what I hear... But I want to see the girl. John Pendleton came erect in his chair. You must see her, man. Couldn't you... say through Dr. Warren? The other shook his head. I'm afraid not. Warren has been very decent, though. He told me himself that he suggested consultation with me at the first, but Miss Harrington said no so decisively that he didn't dare venture it again, even though he knew of my desire to see the child. Lately, some of his best patients have come over to me, so of course that ties my hand still more effectually. But, Pendleton... I've got to see that child. Think of what it may mean to her if I do. Yes, and think of what it will mean if you don't, retorted Pendleton. But how can I, without a direct request from her aunt, which I'll never get? She must be made to ask you. How? I don't know. No, I guess you don't nor anybody else. 
She is too proud and too angry to ask me. After what she said years ago, it would mean if she did ask me. But when I think of that child, doomed to lifelong misery, and when I think that maybe in my hands lies a chance of escape, but for that confounded nonsense we call pride and professional etiquette, I... He did not finish his sentence, but with his hands thrust deep into his pockets, he turned and began to tramp up and down the room again, angrily. But if she could be made to see, to understand, urged John Pendleton. Yes, and who's going to do it? demanded the doctor with a savage turn. I don't know. I don't know groaned the other, miserably. Outside the window, Jimmy Bean stirred suddenly. Up to now he had scarcely breathed, so intently had he listened to every word. "'Well, by jinx! I know!' he whispered exultingly. "'I'm a-going to do it!' And forthwith he rose to his feet, crept stealthily around the corner of the house, and ran with all his might down Pendleton Hill. End of chapter 29 Read by The Story Girl Chapter 30 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by The Story Girl Chapter 30 Jimmy Takes the Helm It's Jimmy Bean. He wants to see you, ma'am, announced Nancy in the doorway. Me, rejoined Miss Polly, plainly surprised. Are you sure he did not mean Miss Pollyanna? He may see her a few minutes today, if he likes. Yes, am I told him. But he said it was you he wanted. Very well, I'll come down and Miss Polly arose from her chair a little wearily. In the sitting-room she found waiting for her a round-eyed, flush-faced boy, who began to speak at once. "'Ma'am, I suppose it's dreadful, what I'm doing and what I'm saying, but I can't help it. It's for Pollyanna, and I'd walk over hot coals for her, or face you, or, or anything like that, any time.' "'and I think you would, too, if you thought there was a chance for her to walk again. "'And so that's why I come to tell ye that as long as it's only pride and et... "'et something that's keeping Pollyanna from walking, "'why, I knew you would ask Dr. Chilton here if you understood... "'What?' interrupted Miss Polly, "'the look of stupefaction on her face changing to one of angry indignation. "'Jimmy sighed despairingly. "'There, I didn't mean to make you mad. "'That's why I begun by telling you about her walking again. "'I thought you'd listen to that. "'Jimmy, what are you talking about?' "'Jimmy sighed again. "'That's what I'm trying to tell ye. "'Well, then, tell me. "'But begin at the beginning and be sure I understand each thing as you go. "'Don't plunge into the middle of it as you did before "'and mix everything all up. Jimmy wet his lips determinedly. "'Well, to begin with, Dr. Chilton come to see Mr. Pendleton, and they talked in the library. Do you understand that?' "'Yes, Jimmy.' Miss Polly's voice was rather faint. "'Well, the window was open, and I was weeding the flower bed under it, and I heard him talk.' "'Oh, Jimmy! Listening? Torn about me, and twant sneak listening!' bridled Jimmy. And I'm glad I listened. You will be when I tell ye. Why, it may make Pollyanna walk. Jimmy, what do you mean? Miss Polly was leaning forward eagerly. There, I told you so, nodded Jimmy contentedly. Well, Dr. Chilton knows some doctor somewhere that can cure Pollyanna, he thinks. Make her walk, you know. But he can't tell sure till he sees her. And he wants to see her something awful, but he told Mr. Pendleton that you wouldn't let him. Miss Polly's face turned very red. 
But, Jimmy, I... I can't... I couldn't. That is... I didn't know. Miss Polly was twisting her fingers together helplessly. Yes, and that's what I come to tell ye, so you would know, asserted Jimmy eagerly. They said that for some reason, I didn't rightly catch what, you wouldn't let Dr. Chilton come, and you told Dr. Warren so, and Dr. Chilton couldn't come himself without you asked him on account of pride and professional ed... ed... well, ed something anyway, and they was wishing somebody could make you understand, only they didn't know who could, and I was outside the window, and I says to myself right away, by jinx, I'll do it, and I come, and have I made you understand? Yes, but Jimmy, about that doctor, implored Miss Polly feverishly. Who was he? What did he do? Are you sure he could make Pollyanna walk? I don't know who he was. They didn't say. Dr. Chilton knows him, and he's just cured somebody just like her, Dr. Chilton thinks. Anyhow, they didn't seem to be doing no worrying about him. "'Twas you they was worrying about, "'cause you wouldn't let Dr. Chilton see her. "'And say, you will let him come, won't you? "'Now you understand?' "'Miss Polly turned her head from side to side. "'Her breath was coming in little, uneven, rapid gasps. "'Jimmy, watching her with anxious eyes, "'thought she was going to cry.' But she did not cry. After a minute, she said brokenly, Yes, I'll let Dr. Chilton see her. Now run home, Jimmy, quick. I've got to speak to Dr. Warren. He's upstairs now. I saw him drive in a few minutes ago. A little later, Dr. Warren was surprised to meet an agitated, flush-faced Miss Polly in the hall. He was still more surprised to hear the lady say, a little breathlessly, "'Dr. Warren, you asked me once to allow Dr. Chilton to be called in consultation, and I refused. Since then I have reconsidered. I very much desire.' That you should call in Dr. Chilton. Will you not ask him at once? Please? Thank you. End of chapter 30 Read by the Story Girl Chapter 31 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by The Story Girl. Chapter 31 A New Uncle. The next time Dr. Warren entered the chamber where Pollyanna lay, watching the dancing shimmer of color on the ceiling, a tall, broad shouldered man followed close behind him. Dr. Chilton! Oh, Dr. Chilton! "'How glad I am to see you!' cried Pollyanna. And at the joyous rapture of the voice, more than one pair of eyes in the room brimmed hot with sudden tears. "'But of course, if Aunt Polly doesn't want—' "'It is all right, my dear. Don't worry,' soothed Miss Polly, agitatedly, hurrying forward. "'I have told Dr. Chilton that, that I want him to look you over.' with Dr. Warren this morning. "'Ah, oh, then you asked him to come,' murmured Pollyanna contentedly. "'Yes, dear, I asked him. That is—' But it was too late. The adoring happiness that had leapt to Dr. Chilton's eyes was unmistakable, and Miss Polly had seen it. With very pink cheeks she turned and left the room hurriedly. Over in the window, the nurse and Dr. Warren were talking earnestly. Dr. Chilton held out both his hands to Pollyanna. Little girl, I'm thinking that one of the very gladdest jobs you ever did has been done today. 
he said, in a voice shaken with emotion. At twilight a wonderfully tremulous, wonderfully different Aunt Polly crept to Pollyanna's bedside. The nurse was at supper. They had the room to themselves. "'Pollyanna, dear, I'm going to tell you, the very first one of all. Some day I'm going to give Dr. Chilton to you for your uncle. And it's you that have done it all. Oh, Pollyanna, I'm so happy and so glad, darling. Pollyanna began to clap her hands, but even as she brought her small palms together the first time, she stopped and held them suspended. Aunt Polly? Aunt Polly! Were you the woman's hand and heart he wanted so long ago? You were! I know you were! And that's what he meant by saying I'd done the gladdest job of all, today. I'm so glad! Why, Aunt Polly, I don't know, but I'm so glad that I don't mind even my legs now. Aunt Polly swallowed a sob. Perhaps some day, dear. But Aunt Polly did not finish. Aunt Polly did not dare to tell yet the great hope that Dr. Chilton had put into her heart. But she did say this, and surely this was quite wonderful enough to Pollyanna's mind. Pollyanna, next week you're going to take a journey. On a nice, comfortable little bed you're going to be carried in cars and carriages to a great doctor who has a big house many miles from here, made on purpose for just such people as you are. He's a dear friend of Dr. Chilton's, and we're going to see what he can do for you. End of Chapter 31 Read by The Story Girl Chapter 32 of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by The Story Girl Chapter 32 Which is a letter from Pollyanna Dear Aunt Polly and Uncle Tom Oh, I can! I can! I can walk! I did today all the way from my bed to the window. It was six steps. My, how good it was to be on legs again. All the doctors stood around and smiled, and all the nurses stood beside of them and cried. A lady in the next ward, who walked last week first, peeked into the door, and another one, who hopes she can walk next month, was invited in to the party, and she laid on my nurse's bed and clapped her hands. Even Black Tilly, who washes the floor, looked through the piazza window and called me Honey Child when she wasn't crying too much to call me anything. I don't see why they cried. I wanted to sing and shout and yell. Oh, 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 just think. I can walk, walk, walk. Now I don't mind being here almost ten months. And I didn't miss the wedding anyhow. Wasn't that just like you, Aunt Polly, to come on here and get married right beside my bed so I could see you? You always do think of the gladdest things. Pretty soon, they say, I shall go home. I wish I could walk all the way there. I do. I don't think I shall ever want to ride anywhere any more. It will be so good just to walk. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm glad for everything. Why, I'm glad now I lost my legs for a while. For you never, never know how perfectly lovely legs are till you haven't got them. That go, I mean. I'm going to walk eight steps tomorrow with heaps of love to everybody. Pollyanna End of chapter 32 Recording by The Story Girl
End of Pollyanna by Eleanor H. Porter